right, let's get on with chapter two, minerals. Uh, <coughs> this is a prettier picture to start with in the blank screen. So uh, in, in this mineral uh, lecture, it's very much uh, geared towards kind of what we're going to do for the laboratory part of this course. Um, I'll kind of go through how we identify minerals, their different properties, how a mineral uh, is defined. What what exactly is a mineral? Is a cup of oil a mineral? Is is a piece of ice a mineral? Uh, so there's kind of rules that we create to define that something is a uh, a mineral. And I like showing this picture. Uh, in in a perfect world, I'd take all you guys to the Smithsonian. Uh, they kind of have this hall of of geology. I forget what it was called exactly, but they've got all these fantastic minerals. Uh, and one of the neat things you see there is as you walk through here, you'll see a lot of quartz uh, in this hallway, and a lot of it's from Arkansas. And they've got this one slab, uh, which is like takes up this much space, and it's just quartz crystals all over it. And it's cool to see because it's like from Hot Springs, uh, Arkansas. So it's it's pretty cool to see a part of this state uh, in something like the Smithsonian. But anyway, on to uh, primarily minerals. I'll talk a little bit about atoms and elements which make up minerals. Uh, if you go on and decide to become a geology major, this next class you usually take after general geology uh, is mineralogy. Maybe you'll take historical geology, is more, which is more about like what happens, what has happened through time. But uh, in uh, I took mineralogy as my second course, and you kind of get you go heavily into this uh, the chemistry of things and why minerals look the way they do. Uh, and so forth. So let's talk a little bit about atoms and elements. I don't want to get too far into the chemistry because, hey, you know, hopefully you've kind of had high school chemistry and remember some of this stuff. But uh, just as a review, let's go through it real quick. So atoms are the smallest electrically neutral symbols of mineral. Hopefully you know what atoms are. Um, a single atom is a type of element, right? If I have some random atom, that atom has a certain number of protons, and that defines, the number of protons defines what element something is. It's not the amount of neutrons, it's not the amount of electrons, it's the amount of protons. And we see the atomic number of an element on the periodic table, which we'll look at in a second. Uh, it's the number of protons. If something has one proton, it is... Hydrogen, if it has two protons, it is helium. There's no way to change that. You can change the number of neutrons in those atoms. You can change the number of electrons that are floating around those atoms, and you'll get, you'll have the same element, but you'll have a slightly different uh, atom, and I'll talk more about uh, that in a second. That's more kind of getting into isotopes. So anyway, uh, there's 92 naturally occurring elements. Um, you know, you go watch some sci-fi movies and they'll talk about, oh, we've discovered a new element, uh, unobtainium or, or whatever. And it's like, you know, you, you've got to, you can't find an element that exists like between uh, hydrogen and between helium. It's just not possible. There's, there's nothing between them because you can't have a proton and a half. There's only, the protons define what the element is. We could... X out all these names we have for all these different elements. So we could just say this is element one, this is element two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, because of the number of protons they have. So isotopes are varieties of an element that have different numbers of neutrons, but the same number of protons. Uh, if you ever hear about carbon dating, right? Carbon, uh, its atomic number is six, which means it's got six protons. Normally, most carbon floating around out in the world, in you, in me, in the air, has six neutrons. Therefore, we tend to call that carbon-12. That is an isotope of carbon, carbon-12. We just kind of add the neutrons and add the protons. If we talk about uh, carbon dating, we actually are talking about carbon-14. It doesn't have six neutrons. It's got eight neutrons. This makes this 
isotope, this isotope, of carbon slightly heavier, and this isotope of carbon uh, is actually radioactive. It's not stable. It starts to decay towards carbon-13 and carbon-12. And there's also carbon-13 that has seven, uh, seven neutrons. This is getting a little bit advanced already for this early in the class, but hopefully you're kind of following me along. I think isotopes are really important. It's what I worked on for my research, and I was able to do some really cool stuff. I mean, I was so fearful of chemistry in, uh, in college and everything. I wasn't very good at it. I'm still not very good at it. But I started to realize the things you could do with it, the things you could kind of search for. And, and what I did for a lot of my research was I looked at uh, carbon-13 uh, versus carbon-12. Or what I should say is not versus. I should say I looked at the ratios of carbon-13 uh, versus carbon-12. And these ratios in uh, your body, in, in, in your bones, uh, in plants, uh, can change depending on the environment, depending on what you're eating. And so I, can, I found out really neat things about like, oh, these horses in Louisiana 15 million years ago were living out in the, uh, the fields and the pastures and these weird animals called Procynthetoceros, which kind of look like a half deer, half moose, moose with a slingshot bone on their nose. Uh, they were living in the forests, and they were browsers eating off trees and things. So you could do some really cool, really cool stuff with this. And, and this the kind of technology that's looking at this kind of stuff is getting more and more advanced. And uh, it's really helping us figure out what happened uh, long, long ago. But anyway, I'm kind of uh, running on with, with isotopes. Uh, another thing that's important with this is, so I'm talking about carbon here. You can also look at oxygen. Uh, which has eight protons. I had to look. I forgot. It's got eight protons, and normally it's got eight neutrons. But sometimes it can have nine neutrons. Sometimes it can have ten neutrons. And we call these, uh, we call all of these, so with eight and eight, it's O16. With uh, eight and nine, it's O17. And with eight and ten, it's O18. And we can look at the ratios of, uh, of these oxygen isotopes in something. And, and learn about, usually when we look at this stuff, it's talking about temperature. Uh, so when we look at the changes in temperature over millions and millions of years, this is primarily the tool that we're using. We're comparing uh, O18 to O016. Um, more on that later. So here's the periodic table of elements. And you can see, where's my mouse? You can see we've got carbon here. It's got six protons, nitrogen, seven protons, oxygen, eight protons. Uh, some of the other elements we'll kind of be discussing and I'll always kind of talk about and come back to is uh, silicon, right here. It's got 14. Uh, I'll talk about calcium over here. Uh, and that's, uh, that's about all the minerals I'll really uh, get into. Maybe I'll mention copper sometimes a bit. Uh, these these minerals here, calcium, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, silicon, uh, actually not really nitrogen so much. We don't talk about nitrogen in, in rocks. It's definitely in the atmosphere, but not so much in rocks. Uh, but these these elements we'll be talking a lot about uh, in this class <clears throat> in the form of uh, silicon dioxide, which is called silica, and calcium, oop, 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 calcium, Carbonate, which is calcite or limestone. So, hitting it with you with these now, get them in your brains, and we'll uh, we'll definitely talk about them later on. So, isotopes. I already talked a bunch about isotopes. Maybe I should have waited. So, I mentioned uh, stable isotopes. Stable isotopes are like the O18 and uh, and O16. And comparing those things, those are stable isotopes. The C13. And uh, the, the, the C12, uh, those are all stable isotopes. But once you get up, if things get too many neutrons, they will start to go through radioactive decay. And we'll, uh, we'll start talking about radioactive decay more when we get into uh, geologic age and dating rocks and that sort of thing. So we can use things like carbon-14, which is radioactive, and takes 
a certain amount of time, a definitive amount of time to decay to carbon-13 and carbon-12. Um, and we use that as a, as a clock to kind of uh, determine how old something is. However, carbon only works for like, uh, what was it, 60,000 years or 40,000 years. And we, we use some fancier, larger elements to look at things that are millions or billions of years old. But anyway, uh, over here, over here, we, uh, I kind of mentioned how we can use oxygen isotopes. So there's O18 uh, to look at changes in temperature over time. You notice there's not a degree marker here. This is something most people don't know. Uh, it's really hard to actually figure out like what's what's the actual temperature is it you know are we talking is it like 50 degrees Fahrenheit back then or is it like 70 degrees Fahrenheit back then and we we don't really we don't really know using just o18 we just know it's relatively colder or it's relatively warmer and we can make some good guesses based on uh, using some other pieces of information to figure out kind of what the temperature actually was. Uh, it's not too hard figuring out, you know, several hundred thousand years ago, but when you get way back to millions and millions and millions of years ago, it gets a little difficult. But there are some new methods that's coming out. One of the things I was working on in grad school was uh, looking at isotopes, uh, not as single atoms, but looking at like a CO2 molecule, right? So you've hopefully heard of CO2 before. CO2. Well, guess what? I can make it like this, where it's carbon and oxygen and oxygen. I can look at, uh, I'm getting really advanced here, so feel free to tune me out if this is going over your head, but we can uh, look at carbon dioxide as kind of its own large isotope. So I might have a carbon dioxide molecule that's got C13 and O18 and O16, and you may be breathing out. You, you are right now breathing out carbon dioxide, some of, just some, just a few, of the carbon dioxide molecules out of the millions that are coming out of your mouth or billions that are coming out of your mouth or whatever that big number is, uh, some of them are this type. Most of them are this type. But some of them are a little bit heavier. And the amount of uh, the heavier ones that exist uh, are dependent upon temperature is pretty cool and we've learned that we can use this tool and we can go look at things that are made out of calcium carbonate uh, because it's got co2 in there the co3 where that comes from is basically the co2 that you ingest the co2 that you ingest um, anyway i'm getting ahead of you and maybe some of you guys are sticking with me and thinking this is cool but we can this is kind of how a uh, new method we can use to go back in time here to uh, figure out exactly what the temperature was uh, within a pretty close range, about plus or minus two degrees Celsius, the last time I was reading about any of this stuff. Anyway, moving on. So, backing up to uh, to kind of atoms and elements, and getting a little bit talking about crystals. So, I'm I'm not gonna make you guys memorize the types of bonds, you know, covalent bonding and, and that kind of stuff. You should have gotten that in high school chemistry. And if you want to go back and review it, you can. I'm not going to refer to it. I just want you to be aware that, hey, guess what? Uh, atoms bond to each other. And when they bond to each other, we get molecules like that CO2 I was talking about, or like over here, uh, NaCl, which is salt. No, it's not salt. It's halite. When NaCl bonds together and forms this, this uh, molecule, which is salt, yes, it's salt, the mineral form for it is called uh, halite. And you have some of it in your little sample bag or in your sample box if we're in the classroom. So anyway, uh, these atoms, uh, depending upon their, their electric charge, how many, the, you know, the arrangements of their electrons will bond together. And when they bond together, they will create a crystalline structure. And the way NaCl bonds together uh, is it sort of makes this cubic pattern. And if you look at the halite we've got, uh, it tends to form in cubes, which is kind of neat. And that's a representation of how those atoms bond at that tiny, 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 tiny level. Uh, you can see it with your naked eye if you, you leave those elements alone and you don't mess with them and you let them bond for very long periods of time and you can grow large crystals. Uh, there are different types of crystal groups of mineral mineral groups 
depending upon kind of what their crystalline structure is made out of, the silicate minerals are probably the most important uh, and the most common. And again, they're made out of silicon and oxygen, like I mentioned before. Uh, and kind of the primary little nugget of that is silicon dioxide. And here's what that looks like. So we have the silicon oxygen tetrahedron. Uh, it's a silicate ion that is surrounded by four oxygen atoms. And if you're paying it closely attention, you're now saying, dude, you've been writing SiO2, and now you just said SiO4. You just said four oxygens when we've been looking at two oxygens. That's true. However, when you take these tetrahedrons and you start sticking them to each other, they will share oxygen molecules. And when you stick them all together and they're all sharing, uh, the ratio of silicon to oxygen is actually SiO2, not SiO4. So anyway, this, this basic structure, this little tetrahedron, and there's the tetrahedron, uh, is the basis for a lot of the rocks we see, especially the rocks at the surface uh, of the earth, which are primarily made out of SiO2, out of these silicates. And a lot of the processes we see are dominated by this. Uh, why one volcano is more explosive than the other is because of SiO2. Not just because, but for the most part, it's because of SiO2, the amount of silicate uh, silicates in that magma. Um, the types of beaches we see and where we see them, whether they're uh, beaches made of, of limestone, <clears throat> sorry, of calcite, of busted up limestone, or whether they're beaches made of sand. So if you go to the pretty beaches in Florida, they're calcium carbonate. They're, they're, uh, they're made of calcite, um, which is busted up limestone. Uh, however, if you go to the beaches in Texas, they're SiO2. They're eroded quartz. More on that later. And here they are in a larger picture. Behold them in all their glory. So more on those tetrahedra. Uh, some professors go farther into this than I do. You will definitely go farther into it if you take mineralogy. Uh, but this is kind of how these tetrahedra, so there's one right there, just a single one, and how they bond, depending on how they bond to each other, will get different minerals and we'll even get kind of different mineral groups. So if the silicates, tetrahedra are just on their own, uh, we'll just kind of get this isolated structure. An example of that is olivine. We'll talk about that later. If they, excuse me, if they start forming in these chains or double chains, uh, we'll get the pyroxene group or the amphibole group and the individual minerals for these are uh, hornblende and augite uh, are some that we look at. Uh, and there's the sheet silicate structures, which are the micas, which makes sense. If you look at a mica, it's very flat. Or the ones where they're all kind of growing together, and that's where we kind of start talking about quartz and feldspars, which are uh, uh, much, much, um, they're hard due to these this complex bonding. So anyway, I'm not going to test you on this stuff, but I want to make you aware of it. Uh, if you go on in geology and go into mineralogy, this stuff becomes uh, really important and kind of how we classify different minerals. I'm not going to make you go through this classification. Like I said, some other professors will. Some of the geology professors here at Ernwac uh, absolutely go into it. But for me, you know, I, I never really encountered this stuff beyond mineralogy or may, maybe into igneous rocks. You'll, you'll discuss it. Um, so it, it's, it's definitely... Uh, important in understanding why minerals are the way they are and how we can classify them separately. And when you start learning about not just a dozen minerals or 20 minerals, but when you start looking at a hundred of them or 200 of them, you kind of want to start to classify them and figure out what's what. So moving on, what is a mineral? What defines a mineral? I'm sitting here drinking some coffee. Is my coffee a mineral? What if I freeze it? What if I have a little ice cube of coffee? Is that a mineral? What about uh, what about a piece of coal? Is a piece of coal 
a mineral. It's a stop sign of mineral. Anyway, so number one, a mineral is naturally occurring. It is not something that is man-made. It has to be naturally occurring, and we have to find it uh, in in nature. Can we kind of unnaturally grow minerals? Can I grow some salt crystals? Is it is a if I go take some salt water and boil off the water on my stove top and I see crystals in the bottom, are those minerals? Yeah, they're not necessarily man-made. I sort of uh, unnaturally formed them, but it's still a mineral. But examples of uh, not man-made are something uh, like plastic. Plastic is, I don't know why I'm typing or spelling this out. Plastic is not a mineral. It is man-made out of hydrocarbons. A mineral is inorganic. It is not something that is alive, nor was it never alive. Is coal a mineral? Coal was basically, it was once alive, right? Uh, it is the leftover tiny, 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 tiny bits of, uh, of material from usually plants that collects over time and gets compressed. Uh, and so coal is not a mineral because it is organic. So it has to be something that is inorganic, like salt. Salt is inorganic. It is not alive. It has to be crystalline. The atoms have to be arranged in an orderly pattern, right? So we talked about this bonding before. Uh, here's a lead sulfide. This is galena. We'll look at galena later for sure. It's probably one of the neater minerals we look at. Uh, or halite, which is actually fairly similar to galena. Completely different elements, but it kind of bonds in the same way. It makes these cube shapes. Uh, these are crystalline. So they have to have atoms that are arranged in an orderly pattern. So a blob of something uh, just put together. I guess plastic is another good example. But uh, these are not crystalline. It has to have a definite chemical composition. So SiO2 uh, is quartz. NaCl is halite, it's salt. Um, yeah. A mineral has to be a solid. It cannot be a gas. It cannot be a liquid. So when I mentioned oil earlier, oil is definitely not a mineral, right? For one, oil is organic. It's just like the coal. <clears throat> Two, it's not a solid. So oil is not a mineral. Now, so uh, there's different ways to remember this, but before I get onto that, uh, these are the five ways, natural, inorganic, crystalline, definite chemical composition, and a solid. What about... H2O. Is it a mineral? And you're saying, uh, if you freeze it, yes. H2O, naturally occurring. Yep. H2O, inorganic. Water is not alive. Yep. Crystalline. Yeah, if you freeze H2O, uh, it forms in an orderly pattern and you get you get ice. Yep. Definite chemical composition, H2O. Yep. It's solid if I freeze it. Yep. So is H2O a mineral? It depends on who you ask. Some people say no. I don't like those people. <laughs> the argument is that the majority of H2O on this planet uh, is not a solid, therefore it's uh, not a mineral, but it's, you know, nobody really, it doesn't matter whether it's kind of a mineral, I guess, I guess it's kind of arbitrary. It's just a fun thing to kind of talk about and argue about, but we kind of go through it and you can kind of make the argument, hey, if this is a mineral, naturally occurring inorganic crystalline, definitely chemical composition is solid, it's a mineral. And if your argument is, oh, well, most of the H2O on earth isn't frozen, therefore it's, uh, it's not a mineral, then I'm going to say, well, dude, if I go to Mars, the H2O on Mars is, uh, and yes, there's H2O on Mars, H2O on Mars is frozen. 
or if I go to some of the other moons uh, in our solar system, which have a lot of H2O, it's frozen. It's all solid, or most of it's solid. Now is it? Now is it a mineral? So I'd argue that H2O is, is a mineral. But there are definitely those that argue against it. But it's not a real argument that anybody actually takes seriously. Anyway, so how can you remember this? Uh, there's fun ways that you can remember this. Uh, I forget what uh, what these are. What's, what's this called? Danielle? What do you, when you use like a naming system, like kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species, and you kind of use a letter from each thing, what's that called? An, uh, an ant, not an antonym. Onomatopoeia. Onomatopoeia, is that it? Maybe. Sorry, did I wake you up? It's okay. I'm recording you. I'm, I'm, I'm including you in my lecture. Hi, friends. <laughs> anyway, thank you. I couldn't remember it. That's my fiance. She's also a geologist. Uh, she's in some of the pictures I include in some of these things. So you'll get, maybe get to know her even if you're not in the classroom. Um, <clears throat> so we can use a. Uh, in uh, the, the, the classic thing, I guess, is called Nicodes, N-I-C-D-S. Now I can define minerals. Yay. What's up? It's called a mnemonic. A mnemonic. A mnemonic. A new, do I, am I going to spell this right? N-E-M-O-N-I-C. Is that what she said? Mnemonic. Doesn't look right. That's probably right, though. It's close enough. So anyway, you can use a mnemonic. Um, story time. So when I was in sixth grade, we had to learn all of the metric kind of uh, units. So uh, kilo, uh, hecto, um, deca, meter. Yeah, so just like meter. Uh, deci, centi, and milli. Right, so this is like kilogram, hectogram, decagram. Uh, this would actually just be gram. Uh, decigram, centigram, milligram, or uh, kilometer, hectometer, decameter, meter, decimeter, centimeter, millimeter. So in sixth grade, the teacher, uh, we were in this math class, and the teacher said, all right, get into groups, and somebody come up with a mnemonic for this, just like you could do for for this. And we'll all come up with one and then we'll all kind of secretly vote on which is our favorite. That was the last year the teacher decided to do that. A guy by the name, a kid by the name of Greg, came up with kick his dead mom down cookie mountain. It's terrible. Absolutely terrible. But we all laughed. So anyway, you can come up with fun things like this. Uh, with the geologic age, I'm not going to have you guys memorize geologic ages, but I had to. Uh, I actually use something, and it's not something I can utter out loud because it's uh, not offensive, but it's it's very adult. But it helps me remember it. So, uh, you know, use what you can. So let's talk about the physical properties of minerals. <clears throat> the first one. Is color when you grab a, uh, a mineral you will probably first notice it's it's color whether it's pink or blue or whatever and it's kind of your first impression now that can be dangerous because color isn't very reliable to define a mineral some minerals will only have one color other minerals will come in a rainbow of colors for instance that first picture I showed you at the beginning of the lecture all these, these are all different minerals. So minerals can come in a bunch of different colors. These are all the same mineral. This is all fluoride. Fluoride can be a bunch of different colors. Uh, quartz can be a bunch of different colors. Calcite can be a bunch of different colors. And they can even all be the same colors as each other. I could show you another wall of calcite and it would look a lot like this. And quartz and it would look a lot like this. It would have this rainbow effect of colors <laughs> excuse me so can we kind of what else can we use to help us out streak is something we can do the streak is sort of the true color of a mineral 
if you want to define the the truth of nature in a mineral, uh, you can try to streak it. And we'll do this in lab, or, or you'll kind of, uh, if, if this is the online course, which I'm recording this for right now, uh, we'll, uh, I'll show you how, kind of how to do these streak plates. I've got some videos on it and how you streak a mineral. But basically, you, uh, you take a mineral like, like so, and you press it down on a streak plate, and it will leave a colored streak. Usually. Usually. I say usually uh, because if there's minerals that are really hard, um, and we'll talk about that in a second, but if you have a really hard mineral, it won't actually streak the plate because it's harder than the plate. It's just going to scratch the plate. But that actually tells us something about the mineral, which is hardness. So a mineral's hardness is the resistance to being uh, scratched. And we have this hardness scale called the Mohs hardness scale, and it goes from 1 to 10. And it depends upon how tightly packed the atoms are uh, in, in the mineral. So here is Mohs hardness scale, and you've probably heard before, oh, diamond's like the hardest thing ever. It is a 10. And then we've got uh, corundum and topaz and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, corundum is actually, if you, uh, if you have a piece of red corundum, you have a ruby. If you have a piece of green corundum, you have, very good, an emerald. And if you have a piece of blue corundum, you have, correct, sapphire. I'm abbreviating because I'm not going to write all this out. Uh, so yeah, those are the gemstones of corundum. So all of those are actually the same mineral. Kind of weird. Uh, the gemstone names that we give things, like the varieties... Uh, they're not actually individual minerals. Quartz is a great example. You've probably heard of amethyst or citrine. Uh, those are both quartz. They're just different varieties of quartz, different colors of quartz. But anyway, so you have potassium, feldspar, aptite, and et cetera, et cetera. There are different things we can use to test the hardness of minerals. I'll insert some here. So if you can scratch a mineral with your fingernail, there is a really good chance you have gypsum or talc. And you can use some other properties to help you figure out which is which. Uh, if you can scratch it with a penny. Now, it has to be a copper penny, right? It has to be a legit copper penny. That means it needs to be a penny uh, before 1982, I believe. Those are made out of copper, and modern pennies are just coated in copper. They're zinc uh, coated in copper. I'm kind of a coin collector. That's why I have that in my brain. Um and there's fluorite and apatite, and this, this glass in particular, this is kind of our best tool uh, for testing hardness. This is kind of the first thing uh, you tend to go to if you want to figure something out. Um, a lot of the time, you know, I mentioned that a lot of minerals can be a lot of different colors. I said calcite can be a lot of different colors. Fluorite can be a lot of different colors, and so can quartz. And these minerals can look a lot like each other, a lot like each other. I, if I, before this class started, if I throwed you a purple piece of fluorite, you'd be like, oh, it's amethyst, that's so pretty. I'd be like, nope, it's fluorite. If I have a piece of glass, I can try to scratch that glass with my sample. And if it scratches the glass, boom, I know I've probably got quartz. If it's one of these minerals that looks similar to each other. If it does not scratch glass, I know I've got either maybe fluorite or calcite or maybe even gypsum which can look like those other three as well uh so how do i determine between these three well calcite will fizz and i can also scratch it with a penny uh gypsum i can scratch with my fingernails so that's kind of how i let you know get rid of those two fluorite's kind of hard to tell from anything you kind of have to uh uh figure out what it's not and then you kind of realize you're left with fluorite the thing that you uh kind of need to know about to really accurately identify fluorite is cleavage. So cleavage is the uh, tendency of a mineral to break along planes. So they're planes of weak bonding. So here's kind of some, uh, some drawings over here. And it kind of shows how different minerals will break. Calcite and dolomite will break in these rhombic patterns. Halite and galena, which I've mentioned before, will break in cubes. They've got three planes of cleavage. 
Orthoclase has two planes of cleavage, one here, one here. This, and on this side, it kind of break, it fractures. It doesn't break cleanly. Uh, micas will just break along this flat plane. Uh, like I said with Galena, there's three planes. Boom, boom, boom. Uh, and then Calcite also has three planes. They're just at different angles to each other. <clears throat> and then Fluorite can be really weird. It actually has, I think, six planes of cleavage. One, two, I don't think it shows it accurately here. Three, four. And you'd say, oh, that side over there. But that side's actually parallel to this side. But anyway, I don't think this shows it accurately. <laughs> but if I, if I had a, uh, a sample of halite, I'd kind of show you. Halite can also, sorry, fluorite. Fluorite can also break into cubes. It's kind of weird. But don't worry too much with that. In fact, uh, yeah, don't worry too much about fluorite. So cleavage means cleave to split, right? Like a cleaver. And again, different minerals break along these different different planes. So here, over here, we're kind of showing those plane directions on how they break. So like the confusing thing may be, oh, I've got a piece of, uh, oops, I've got a piece of halite here, here, and there's a cleavage plane here, there's a cleavage plane here. And there's kind of a tendency to call any face, like the faces that are around this backside over here, that's in the same direction as this plane right here. So it's the same plane of cleavage. The other plane of cleavage on this sample uh, is here. So that's the, that's the three. If this is confusing, that's okay. Uh, when you look at mineral samples, uh, sometimes it's fairly obvious. You know, you have a piece of calcite and you're like, oh yeah, there are these cleavage planes. <clears throat> but when crystals grow together, like you see this little chunk right here, that's a that's a uh, feldspar crystal that's growing into another feldspar crystal. Uh, you'll see a lot of samples like this, and it can be really difficult to kind of understand what you're looking at in terms of cleavage. There's also crystal faces. So if I show you a quartz crystal, and I've got videos on this, uh, the crystal faces of quartz are not cleavage planes. It's not how it breaks. That's kind of how it grows, but not how it breaks. If I break a quartz crystal, uh, it kind of breaks like glass and it fractures and it's kind of just messed up and jagged, but it's not a cleavage plane. So <clears throat> there is this way that some minerals fracture called conchoidal fracture. And if you think of how glass breaks and you kind of see these kind of moon shapes uh, in the break, that's that conchoidal fracture or conchoidal fracture. Uh, not everything, not all minerals fracture like this, but it's something that quartz can do. <clears throat> now, it's hard to identify in every single quartz sample. These are all pieces of quartz, I think. Maybe. These two definitely are. And that should be. But uh, sometimes it just kind of breaks. But point being, it's, it's, not, <clears throat> it's not cleavage. It's a jagged fracture. And kind of the last main thing we can look at, and sometimes this is the first thing you look at when you're kind of trying to identify a mineral. Uh, there's kind of a flow chart you can go through, and we'll talk about that later. But you can look at luster, which is basically how a mineral shines. And the main thing we, we kind of start with is, is it metallic or is it non-metallic? And that's as simple as, does it look like a metal? This piece of galena, it looks like a metal. It's shiny and silver. This piece of kaolinite, it's not shiny. It doesn't look like a metal. If I showed you a piece of fool's gold, you'd say it looks metallic. It's not silvery, but it's kind of gold colored and shiny. What about a piece of quartz? Is quartz metallic? No, it's it's just kind of shiny. We'll kind of call it vitreous. Uh, vitreous. Um. <clears throat> Or we might say that uh, kaolinite is earthy. Uh, but for the most part, we really care about whether it's metallic or non-metallic. So these are the main properties used to identify minerals. I definitely want you to know these, just like I want you to know the uh, what defines a mineral. And don't get these mixed up. I will ask a test question on this, and I will say, 
what are some physical properties used to identify a mineral? And I'll put it in bold. I'll put physical properties in bold. And then half of you will tell me naturally occurring, solid, and organic. And I'll be like, no, I want this stuff. I want the properties. Color, streak, hardness, cleavage, luster. So remember that. There are also some special properties. Some minerals are magnetic, like this piece of magnetite. Very good name. Uh, some minerals have inter interesting optical properties. If you have a nice clear piece of calcite, it does this double refraction where if you put it on a piece of paper and look at words, uh, it'll kind of create two separate pieces of words. Uh, some minerals are fluorescent. You can put them under a UV light and they will fluoresce. Uh, I believe this is calcite here. Calcite will be kind of greenish. Uh, there's something kind of cool called uh, piezoelectricity or piezoelectricity where you can generate electricity by putting pressure on the minerals. So quartz is kind of famous for doing this. Uh, it's the way it's structured chemically in its crystalline form uh, is it has a, a dipole where you've essentially got kind of negatively charged parts of it close to oops got negatively charged parts of it close to other negatively charged parts of it and when you squish and push these closer together uh, it will generate uh, electricity it'll generate a charge where is this used if you have a gas stove like me uh, or if you've ever seen one when you turn on a gas stove or even a heater you'll get you'll need to do that little clicky clicky right that, that ch -ch 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 before it lights off that's a small hammer hitting a little quartz crystal, and it gives off a spark. Uh, if you have some lighters, some of the, uh, you know, like the little stick lighters that you use to, uh, to light your uh, uh, barbecue, it'll have a little trigger right here. And when you pull that trigger, you'll hear a click, click, click. And that's a little hammer hitting a quartz crystal that creates that spark to light the, the gas. So kind of a neat property. This doesn't necessarily help you identify it. It's not like you're going to have a mineral and be like, oh, is this a piece of quartz? Let me hit it with a hammer and see if it gives off an electrical charge. But uh, it's just something that's that's kind of neat. Uh, also with the, uh, the calcite, uh, calcite we can put a weak acid on, and we'll do this uh, in the classroom, if we're in the classroom. Uh, we'll put hydrochloric acid on it, and it'll fizz. And it's one of the really good ways to identify calcite to the point where some geologists in their bags will carry a little bottle of hydrochloric acid because when you walk up to some large rock face, you might want to know, is this a limestone or is this something else? And poof, it fizzes. Oh, yeah, that's definitely a limestone made out of uh, calcite. Oh, so yeah, acid test. I did have it in here. So test for carbonate, which is mainly when we uh, want to know what's if something's made out of calcite. So that is uh, the uh, the mineral lecture, and now you are prepared to start identifying minerals.